I'm not going to unpack everything in that uh, lesson uh, today, but I am going to bring you a message about stewardship and money and giving our money away. I was asked to come here today to uh, preach a stewardship sermon. But I do realize that stewardship sermons are often not the most popular uh, sermons in the church. It's kind of one reason why you bring somebody in from uh, out of town to get them. Uh, and so I'm going to make it easy on you, is my, my idea. Is I'm just going to tell stories. I'm, I'm just going to tell you three stories this morning that I think illustrate important things that the Bible has to say to us about our stewardship of our money, and indeed about giving our money away. The first I call the story of the baptism of the Gauls. I'm sure it's not a historical account. It's probably sort of a medieval urban legend. But the Gauls were real people who lived in what is now France and Belgium at the time of the Roman Empire. They were conquered by the Romans, and there were numerous Gallic uprisings. Some missionaries ventured into this uh, hostile territory. As the story goes, a number of the Gauls became Christians. But when the missionaries baptized them outdoors in a river or a stream, they noticed this peculiar custom. That the, the Gauls would go under the water with one arm, sticking straight up in the air, like that. That just seemed odd, and the missionaries soon found out the reason for it. The next time a battle, or a skirmish broke out, this warlike doll could say, This arm is not baptized. <laughs> because this was the arm with which he wielded his sword or axe, and he could ride off to slay his enemy with his unbaptized arm. Yeah. All right. I use that story as an example of stewardship. I know a lot of people think stewardship is just a fancy word for fundraising, but it's not just about fundraising. Stewardship is about getting completely quit. It is about looking at ourselves and discovering what is it that we want to keep free from the influence of our faith. What is it about our lives that we want to keep unbaptized? And then immersing in the waters of holy baptism. So, often when we talk about stewardship, we end up talking about money. Why? Because I think money is the number one thing that a lot of us want to keep dry. I picture modern Americans today going under the water you know, with that outstretched arm holding, not a sword or an axe, but you know, their, their real phone, uh, and their credit cards, or their pocketbook, or their stock portfolio, or whatever. Uh, the truth is, for many of us, our finances are the one thing we kind of try to keep free from the influence of our faith. No, we all know that, and we don't really when we talk about stewardship in the church, we try to call each other. And we try to do a better job of you know, getting, those, getting those wallets into the baptismal box. That's my first story. My second story has to deal with it just as, what is a steward anyway? Uh, I get asked that. The word used to be common in English, but we don't use it much anymore. A steward is a person who lives in a place that does not belong to them, and uses things that they do not own. And you know, they're expected to take good care of the things that they have kind of on, that they have the use of. So uh, my wife and I, we have uh, five cats. And uh, we like to travel. So uh, when we go on trips, we often get a college student to come and, and, and stay in our house and look after the house and take care of the cats. Now, the college student is typically someone who lives in a cramped dorm room with an annoying roommate, and we have a nice middle class home filled with all kinds of nice middle class stuff. And so they get to spend a couple of weeks, uh, you know, with an upgrade in their living conditions. And, you know, uh, if they're not allergic, it's, uh, 
it's actually a pretty good deal. That's a steward. The Bible, Jesus tells parables about people who go on journeys and they leave the stewards in charge of the house or the vineyard or the farm or whatever, and then they come back and find out if they were good stewards or bad stewards. How the parables do uh, Thus far, all of our uh, uh, students have turned out to be good stewards. But if we were to come back from our trip sometime and find out that, you know, the student had uh, thrown wild parties in our house and broken all the china and spilled the wine all over the carpet and left the poor kitty cats to fend for themselves, that would be what the Bible calls a bad student. And that's one simple point that Jesus parables make over and over again. Everything belongs to God. Uh, this whole planet is God's. Our bodies our families, our finances. Everything we have is a trust, O oh Lord, from thee. So the question might be, are we doing a good job or a not so good job of taking care of all the things that God entrusts us? That's one point. And any number of stewardship services can get treated by those parables when they come up. It's not the main point. The main point is actually something else. Imagine if my wife and I came back from one of our trips to discover that the student had changed the box on the house and said, this is my house. I live here now, and everything here belongs to me. That would be a problem on an entirely different order. And Jesus says in his parables that that is the fundamental problem with humanity. But the problem, it's not just a question of whether we're doing a good job or a you know, less than good job of <coughs> taking care of what God has That's a minor point. The main point <coughs> is that many people don't even know that they are students. They don't know that everything belongs to God. We think it's ours. We think it's all about us to do with as we please. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. But while we're here, we somehow get the notion that everything belongs to us. That, Jesus says, is a fundamental problem of humanity. And when the church talks about stewardship, it needs to drive home that message. It's not ours. Everything belongs to God. All that we are, all that we have. And then I have just one more story, which is about giving to the church. <coughs> you know, I can get there eventually. Uh, and uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's my favorite story. Uh, I like to talk about giving to the church it can be a duty or it can be a delight. It's usually both. Pastor told me he grew up in a small town. And he said, when I was eight years old, my mother sent me to the local florist shop to get some flowers for the table because we were going to have to get a company over for dinner. And so she gave me the money and then I went to the florist and bought the flowers and I carried them home. But as I'm walking home, I'm walking down these streets, and I still remember being nervous, uh, worried that my friends would see me or something. Uh, and they make fun of me. You know, like, Where'd you get the flowers? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it does not take a great deal to make an eight-year-old boy feel so conscious. So I, I did. Uh, I didn't relate. Uh, but he says the point is, I did it because I was an obedient child. My mother asked me to do it, and I did it. That was my duty. Sometimes. This pastor said, I look at giving to the church that way. It's not something I particularly want to do, but I do it because it's something I ought to do. It's just the right thing to do. It's what's fair. It's what's responsible. I do my duty. I do my part. But the story goes on. Ten years later, I still lived in that town. I wasn't eight years old, I was 18 years old. And I was in love with a young woman who lived in the town. And you know what I did? I got some money and I went to that 
same florist shop, and I bought her flowers. And as I was taking them to her house to give them to her, I had this little deja vu moment that I'm doing the same thing I did 10 years ago. I'm walking down some of these same streets, carrying this bouquet of flowers, but it never entered my head to worry about what anybody might say if they saw me or what anybody might think about me, what I was doing, because I was only thinking of two things. How happy she would be to get flowers and how fortunate I was to be the one to bring it into her. And that is not giving just out of duty, but out of pure delight. And sometimes giving to the church can be like that. We give out of love and worship to a God who is so good to us, out of gratitude. We give not just because it's the responsible right thing to do, but because our heart has been so moved with love for God. That's my hope and prayer for all of you. Fall in love with this God who is so good to us. And at least sometimes, when you come here, bring your gifts to the church, and just think about these two things how happy God is to receive anything that we are willing and able to do. And never, ever forget how fortunate we are to be the people making these offerings.